minutes, I'm going to read uh, from 1 Samuel chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to find that passage. Um, if you have other, if, you, if anybody else wants a Bible, I'm sure that it looks like there's lots of them over there. So uh, I want to want to tell you at the beginning. Well, it's, I'm really happy to be here. I I love to. Uh, talk to God's people about the Word of God and, and about the great things God is doing, and, and uh, it's just good to be together, and so thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, we're, uh, this is a fairly small and informal group, I think, and so um, if you want to interrupt me to say, I didn't quite get that, or if you have a question or something, uh, Feel free to do that. I used to be a teacher, and um, I, mean, I uh, expected questions and so on. So if you want to do that, that's fine. Um, you know, I was thinking about the demands that are on our lives. We, we all have many demands, and sometimes we think we're, there are too many things that people expect of us. Uh, and it, 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 as if this were not enough. You know, God seems pretty demanding, too, sometimes. Doesn't he? I mean, he's gracious, he's loving, and so on. But he has pretty high standards. I mean, um, he is our creator, to be sure. And he has a right to our loyalty and obedience. Uh, but then look at, his, look at his laws. They're hard to keep in their external and literal sense. I mean, uh, questions like, uh, uh, or commandments like, have no other gods before me. Never let anything or anyone else become more important than me. That's, that's difficult to do. Um, uh, do not kill. Well, I guess we can, most of us can do that. Or do not commit adultery. But then when it becomes clear, and Jesus makes that clear in the New Testament, that those commands are much more pervasive than, than maybe everybody recognized in the Old Testament. Do not kill means do not even have hate in your heart. Do not commit adultery means don't even, don't even lust. And, and then it becomes, wow, who can keep it? You know, and Jesus kind of boiled those commandments down, love the Lord your God is with all, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, who can do that? God, God is pretty demanding, uh, and and we may wonder who who can who can keep His laws. But really, He's concerned. God is mainly concerned for our hearts, because the actions that He wants us and wants from us flow from a heart that's right with Him and enlivened by his Holy Spirit. God isn't satisfied with a show of affection. He isn't satisfied with part of our attention, or some of our ta time and talent, or a portion of our money. I'm not saying we have to give all our money in church, but he wants all our money, that which we give in church, and that which we use to put food on the table to be to his honor and glory. He has high standards. And sometimes we... We act as though we're safe as long as nobody can see into our hearts. But uh, he, he wants us to give him our full loyalty. And there's a story in the Old Testament I, I want to talk about uh, this evening uh, that demonstrates how the people of ancient Israel failed to take God seriously enough. Uh, if you look at, uh, they forgot that you can't manipulate God. You can't Make God serve you. You're there to serve him. First uh, Samuel chapter 4, second part of verse 1. Now the, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. And when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today uh, before the Philistines? 
let's bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Now, I'm sure you all remember the ark of the covenant. It was a piece of furniture that was designed to fit into the holy of holies in the uh, tabernacle. Later on it would be in the temple, but uh, first in that tent, that tabernacle. It was, uh, it was one of the holiest religious artifacts of Israel. And God originally gave Moses the instructions on how to build it, what to do with it, how to take care of it. Uh, and inside the ark, maybe you remember, was to be put the book of the law, the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod. Uh, and when the ark was moved from place to place, it had to be shielded from view. It was holy, and uh, it had to be covered with a curtain, and then animal hides, and over all a blue cloth. So covered with three layers of stuff. And the tribe of Levi could be the only people who would transport it from place to place. Um, and it was to be, uh, as I said, placed in the Holy of Holies. That, that was such a holy place that only one person could enter once a year, and that was the high priest. Now, what's the big deal about the Ark of the Lord? Well, it was an antique, you know, uh, by this time, about 350 <laughs> years old or so. But that's not why it was important. It was important because it represented a connection between God and his people. Uh, it meant that God was with his people. This is what uh, Exodus 25, verse 22 says. There above the cover between the two cherubim, there were two cherubim on, on the ark, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, God tells him, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. It's not that God was confined to the ark, but the ark, with all that it contained, was a reminder and symbol of the presence of God with his people. It was a statement from God. As long as you <coughs> serve me, as long as you love me with all your heart, and obey me, I will be with you. And that's why they wanted the ark. Right? They were in battle. They lost a big battle. We want God with us. Where's the Lord? We need God with us. So verse 4. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into camp, all Israel raised such, such a great shout that the ground shook. Wow, God is with us now. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all that shouting in the Hebrew camp? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. So this was a critical point in the ongoing Israel's ongoing war with the Philistines. They lost 4,000 soldiers, and the, and the leaders of Israel were, were desperate to give hope to their people. And, and uh, so they, they uh, set... Shiloh, that place where the ark was, was, a, was kind of a holy place. It was where the prophet Samuel talked to God regularly. Um, uh, it was kind of a center of, of the religious life of Israel. And so these leaders reasoned, if we bring the ark of the Lord into camp, then we can be sure that the Lord will be with us and God will help us defeat, uh, defeat the Philistines in battle. And the plan seemed to be working. All the Everybody got a big uh, emotional boost when the ark came into camp. They just knew things were going to be better from now on. And, uh, of course, the Philistines were also frightened. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they heard about this ark. They heard about the Lord and all the great things he had done. And even though that was many years ago, some of these things. 
uh, it was part of of the stories that circulated among the people. The Israelites, they have a great God. If he's with them, what chance do we have to control uh, something that was beyond human control? And, and even so, there will always be people who keep trying to make God do what they want him to do. That's what occultism is all about. That's what witchcraft is all about. That's what New Age uh, thought is all about. Uh, manip trying to gain power by manipulating forces in the world. Uh, but people who confess Christ as Savior and Lord uh, sometimes also try this. Uh, sometimes people start to think, if I do this, then God will do this. Right? If I give money, sometimes you hear this on TV too, right? If I give money, God will have to multiply it back to me. Um, <coughs> To be sure, true giving results in receiving. But it's not a simple formula, is it? Uh, nothing that we do, nothing that we give, can ever be used to make God do what we want, we want Him to do. And to try it only gets us in trouble, because it's not part of true do doing, true service, true loyalty. So whenever anybody starts looking at the, at the service of God from the point of view of what can I get back from this service, that's, that's uh, when we really get into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, it's even possible to get caught in this trap by people who work in the church. Right? Uh, it's easy to lose sight of who's to be served. After all, who does the church belong to? It's God. It's God's church, not ours. We're just here to work in it and, and be, be helped by it and so on. It's not our desires or plans or programs that have to be preserved. It's God's honor and God's service that we're in. And, and titles and forms and arts don't mean anything if it's not God being served. Uh, we all have various responsibilities in the church and we ought to take those seriously. We need to be creative and far-sighted and diligent, and, and uh, but we never must never forget whose church it is. Never forget that God's in control, and uh, the the constant temptation is, and and we've all seen that many times to seek the power and prestige that come with responsibility, and uh, we see it in politics all the time. We start to wonder, is there anybody who gets in a position of power who can de be dependent upon to, remain, uh, to, to maintain their integrity? We start to despair. How, it seems like power corrupts inevitably. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and that's because we people who get in power always forget who the power belongs to. It belongs to God. And servants of God need to keep listening for what God says. And it's because Samuel did that, that, that he was such a success. Um, he listened when God spoke to him. He tuned his heart to hear and obey God's word. He was dependent, like God demanded his people should be. Uh, the Bible says, the Lord, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And this is really interesting, the way this is put. It says, he let none of his words fall to the ground. Isn't that interesting? He let none of his words fall to the ground. Nothing he said was wasted, right? Because he was in tune with God. So how could his words be wasted? If he's in tune with God, he's saying God's words... And same with us. Our words won't be wasted if we're, if we're working in God's power and God's strength and, and, and speaking his word. He, Samuel spoke with the authority of the Lord. For Israel in that day, there were two sets of words to listen to. There were the words of Samuel, who they didn't, uh, the prophet of the Lord, who they didn't bother to consult. And there were the words of those false priests, uh, Hophni and Phinehas and Israel's 
elders, one set of words is true and right. Because it was tied to what God wanted. The other set was useless, as Israel found out. More than a thousand years after this uh, abortive attempt to manipulate God, God sent another message of grace in the person of Jesus, reminding people of what he wanted. Uh, not, not like the Pharisees to focus on the external, you know, just the external, not that the, the doing of the law or keeping of the law is bad, but it's more than the externals that God wants. There were two sets of words to listen to. There were the words in this day, too, of Jesus, and there the wor were the words of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But one set of words was accompanied by real power and authority, and the other set of words, although they looked really nice, they were empty, and nothing came of it. So Jesus was more than a second Samuel who spoke by God's authority. He became the one uh, through whom God did an amazing thing. God, you might say, boxed himself in through Jesus, right? The Pharisees couldn't box God in. Hophni and Phinehas couldn't box God in. But God can box himself in, you see. He'll, let, he'll do, through Jesus, he boxed himself in. He bound himself with unbreakable bonds to those who accept his gift. And so, we're in a position to hold God to his promises. He can't be unfaithful to his own word. I mean, it's even before Jesus, the old, some of the patriarchs and, and other saints of the Old Testament, they, they would always remind God of his promises. Remember you said this, remember you said this, and God liked it when people remind him of his promises. <coughs> And uh, we can't get around God's commands. There aren't any shortcuts. Uh, he still demands obedience. Uh, but if we accept his terms and that, that he's sovereign, we can depend upon him. We can have confidence that he has the best in mind and, and uh, confidence in his promises. So I, I just challenge you to consider how that might change the way you act sometimes. Uh, I think all of us are at least tempted to fall into the trap of trying to manipulate God sometimes. To make him do what we want. You know, there are some people who, and I don't want to say it's a bad thing to pray for God to give us this and give us that. God invites us to do that. But if our prayers are only, gimme, 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 something's wrong. Um, God is... Dwayne's going to give us blessings. People of God, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you'll overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.